Welcome. And in this session, we're going to be reading Mark chapter 8. We're going to be talking about Jesus feeding the 4,000. We're going to be talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. We're going to be talking about how Jesus heals a, um, a blind man at Bethsaida. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus predicts his death and the way of the cross. Let's begin with Mark chapter 8. And we're going to begin at verse 1. In those days, when there was a very great multitude and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to himself and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude. I'm going to stop there for a second. You know, a lot of Jesus' miracles was done just because of his compassion. Okay. And he's looking for the right attitude. He's looking for repentance. He's looking for humility. Actually, probably humility comes before repentance. He's looking for people who are interested in following him. This multitude has followed him, has came out to see him, has endured his hard sayings. As, as we've read over and over again, the message of Jesus was a lot more than what you may think it was, okay? In all of the Gospels and in what pretty much in every account, when it says Jesus began by preaching repentance. He began, and his message of preaching was that of repentance. So he preached repentance. He preached against sin and against hypocrisy. He constantly nailed the, the hypocrites. And he also performed miracles, we know. So the miracles were based upon a lot of, not all the time, but... Um, we got many accounts where Jesus had compassion on people and performed the miracles because of compassion. And the compassion was because of he recognized who these people were, what they've endured to be around him, what they've endured to come out to see him, that they are humble enough to listen to what he has to say without being offended. Okay? Because let's face it, Jesus' message is very offensive to those who love sin. Okay, if you love sin or you love yourself, then if you love your selfish ways, then you will be very offended with what Jesus said and you wouldn't be part of the multitude. You wouldn't be sticking around. So the ones that he had compassion on were the, the humble ones, the ones who were humble, the ones who was in line for or have repented already. So he had compassion on the multitude because they, they have stayed. He said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have stayed with me now three days and have nothing to eat. So here's three days they've gone without any food and possibly without any water as well. So you see again the humility of these people, the hunger of these people, not just uh, for food, uh, but also the hunger for the truth and the hunger for holiness, the hunger to hear the real true word of God, whether or not, whether you like it or not. They're desperate. They're desperate for more of God. They're desperate to hear the true word of God. So they've endured three days with nothing to eat. He, Jesus said, if I send them away fasting to their home, they will faint on the way, and some of them, for some of them have come a long way. So he knew that they might, some of these people might not even make it home. Okay? Verse 4, his disciples answered him, from where could one satisfy these people with bread here in a deserted place? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves. Having given, given thanks, he broke them. Now, I've said this before several times in my uh, teachings, but I'll say it again. I wonder if he gave thanks the same way that Jewish people give thanks today, give thanks today, and that is, you know, by singing their praise to God. You know, Baruch Atadonai Eleinu Melech Alam. I mean, so it's very possible that Jesus said something like that in giving thanks. After all, he's a Jew, full blood Jew. Um, 
a Jewish rabbi at that. And the Jewish people have preserved many wonderful things, as well as this very word that we're reading. Uh, actually, the, the Tanakh, they, pre- they preserve for us uh, probably more than anything. So, um, having given thanks, he broke them and gave them, you know, gave them to his disciples to serve. And they served the multitude. They had a few small fish. Having blessed them, he said to those, or he said to serve these also. They ate and were filled. They took up the seven. They took up seven baskets of broken pieces that were left over. Those who had eaten were about four thousand. Then he sent them away. Again, a lot of these numbers. And in some places, you'll see it very specifically say that they are just men that are counted. So the 4,000 here could have possibly just been just men, uh, not including women and children. That's quite the, quite the miracle, feeding 4,000 plus with just seven loaves of bread and two fish. Verse 10. Immediately he entered into the boat with his disciples and came into the region of Dalmanatha. The Pharisees, or the Parushim, as they, as they are called in Hebrew, came out and began to question him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. Okay. Once again, Jesus did a lot of his signs, uh, a lot of his miracles, because of compassion and not just because someone's testing him to see if he can, it's almost like as if he's a magician or something. Verse 12, he sighed deeply in his spirit and he said, why does this generation seek a sign? Now here in the notes, I got the word translated generation here is genea. Uh, the Greek word genea, it could also be translated people, race, or family. Okay, so why does this generation seek a sign? Or why does this race, or even you would say, why does the human race, why do humans seek a sign? Most certainly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. Notice uh, Mark leaves out what a lot of different gospels put in, and that is that Jesus says that no sign will be given this generation except the sign of the, of the prophet no, uh, Jonah. Um, so again, what we're reading here is uh, a very condensed or of a more boiled down, so to speak, version of the gospel because this is um, the smallest, the shortest gospel amongst the four gospels, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Verse 13, he left them and again entering into the boat, departed to the other side. They forgot to take bread. They didn't, have, they didn't have more than one loaf in the boat with them. So that's, see, what Mark is doing here is that he is uh, he's pitch, painting a picture here. Here's the context. They forgot to take bread. They're probably going, oh, man, I forgot to take bread. I forgot to take bread. I mean, we don't have any bread here. We only got one loaf. And in that context, Jesus said, Jesus warned them, saying, take heed Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. They reasoned with one another, saying, Is it because we we have no bread? Jesus, perceiving it, said to them, Why do you reason that it is because you have no bread? Don't you perceive yet? Don't you know, don't you understand? Neither understand, don't you know? How, you know, how, how can you not get it yet? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, don't you see? Having ears, don't you hear? Don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves among the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They told him 12. When the seven loaves fed the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They told him seven. He said, don't you understand yet? In other words, Jesus was saying to, uh, to them, listen, I'm not worried about bread. I'm not worried about bread. I'm not, talking about, I'm, not, not, I'm not talking about the food you eat here. I'm talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. So 
the scriptures speak of yeast as obviously it's a leavening agent. It's what puffs up. It is the symbol of pride. Okay, we know the pride is one of the three roots of sin. And actually, you can one might argue that sin does not exist without pride being the foundation. It's like the, behind every sin, there's pride. Some kind of selfish, some kind of pride, something behind every sin. Where somebody raises, you know, lifts themselves up against the word of God, against the law of God, against, you know, uh, a man of God, whatever the case may be, against somebody else in pride. Okay, so the yeast of the Pharisees is pride. Okay, uh, that's the problem that the Pharisees had, the number one problem that the Pharisees had. Uh, they did not have the wrong doctrine because we know that in Matthew chapter 23, and check out my video on uh, Matthew 23, that Jesus told his disciples to listen to the Pharisees, do and observe all they tell you to do and observe. He said, but just don't do what they do because what they do is different than what they say. So listen to what they say, but don't do what they do because they're sinners. They're hypocrites. They say one thing and do the opposite. Okay, so verse 22, he came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took hold of the blind man by, by the hand and brought him out of the, of the village. When he had spat in his eyes, how would you like someone to spit in your eyes? Well, you know, and I, a lot of you are probably saying, well, that wouldn't be so bad, but if Jesus can spit in my eyes any day, right? Uh, what would you think? Here's, here's, what would you think if you went to church and a pastor did that to you? Pastors? Church leaders? What would Jesus do? You're supposed to do what Jesus would do, right? Huh. So, um, yeah. When Jesus spat on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. He looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking. So I can't see them very well yet, but I, I'm starting to see. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes. So this is like take two. He looked intently and was, and was restored and saw everyone clearly. He sent him away to his house saying, don't enter into the village nor tell anyone in the village. And I always say this, Jesus almost always tells people not to tell anybody else about the wonderful miracles that they've experienced, that they received. You know, there can be a few different reasons for this. Number one, that Jesus knows that if, if the people knew about it, that there would be too many people coming out and he would be swamped with people and he wouldn't be able to, he wouldn't be able to cater to everybody. Another thing is, too, is that he um, was a humble man. He said, I am meek and lowly in heart in another passage. Uh, so he's not out for attention. He's not out to be a show off. He's not out to get his name. He's not out for a name, for a name and a fame, if you know what I mean. Um, he is out just to do the will of the Father. 27. Jesus went out with his disciples into the villages of Caesarea Philippi. On, on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? They told him, John the baptizer, and others say, Elijah but others, one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter. Now, it's interesting. Peter is always the first one. Like, he seems to be the one that's just always jump, the first one to jump. You know, He's the first one to say, to, to tell uh, Jesus to call him out to walk on the water. You know, the first one uh, to... Uh, to speak up in the Mount of Transfiguration, the first one to speak up in the, uh, in the book of Acts, the first one to say this, uh, the first one to the tomb. Uh, he seems to always be like the first one um, that would, he just jumps um, on these kind of opportunities. So Jesus asked them all, 
Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Christ. Christ, Messiah means the same thing. Hebrew, Mashiach. Verse 30. He commanded them that they should tell no one about him. Here we go again. Again and again and again and again. He began to teach them that the Son of Man, uh, again, the Son of Man here is a very important term. Son of Man in Hebrew, Ben Adam, uh, means Son of Adam, or you can also translate it Seed of Adam. For those of you who have never heard it explained like this before, when I say Seed of Adam, you might clue in at that point in time, but when Adam and Eve sinned, the first promise of the Messiah was that this, that their seed would crush the serpent's head. So the word son of man, the term son of man here is a direct reference to the Messiah. So in, in every Jewish mind in those days, and even in these days as well, if you say the seed of Adam, um, you know, Ben Adam, uh, the Jews would recognize that as this is the Messiah. Son of man is synonymous with the word Messiah, okay? So he began to teach them that the Son of man must suffer many things, must suffer many things. You know, Jesus, as we follow Jesus, as we follow his steps, um, you know, we're not going to be catered to. We're not going to be spoon-fed. God does not spoil his children. Uh, we are going to have to go through some, some tough times. You're going to have to, you might struggle with temptation. You might struggle with sin. You might struggle with selfishness. Struggle with pride. Uh, but you got to put it down. And you got to uh, take up your cross and follow him. Uh, and you've got to be willing to sacrifice all. You've got to be willing to look at Jesus on the cross and say with Paul in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ, Mashiach, lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. So here, he must suffer. He must be rejected. So here's the teaching of Jesus that the Messiah, the, the religious Jewish leader, must suffer and be rejected by the religious elders, and by the chief priests, the religious chief priests, the, the very, very, um, very important to understand. Jesus is saying here that the Messiah, the religious Messiah is going to be rejected by the leaders of the religious people, by the religious leaders of that day. And the scribes, it says here. The scribes being the ones who actually preserved and copied and delivered the, the scriptures to the people, the Torah, the, the prophets, the scriptures to the people. And be killed, he said, and after three days rise again. He spoke to them openly. Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Okay, so Peter's like, oh, no, no, no. He's like, oh, no, you know, you, you know, the Messiah, you know, you're the Messiah. I know you're the Messiah. And so, uh, you know, I don't want to see you go through all this hard times. I don't want to see you be stripped naked and be whipped and to be beaten and have your skin torn off you and your beard torn off you and your flesh, you know, your muscles hanging off your body like tenderized meat and be crucified on the cross as a horrific uh, sign to everybody. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't want you to have to go through all this hard stuff. This is very, very sad to hear about this. You know, and I know a lot of churches today, when they talk about Good Friday, you know, the time when Jesus was crucified, or they say that Jesus was crucified on that day. Um, you know, I I was to a, I used to attend a church where they would be like, okay, let's you know, we we're gonna it's a sad day now. We're gonna we're gonna you know remember his sufferings. It's, it's a sad day, and you know, kind of feel sorry, sorrowful, and all this kind of stuff. 
That is not the heart of God. That's not the heart of God. You know, the prophet Isaiah said, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased yud heh wav ple- It pleased yud heh vav to bruise the Mashiach. It pleased God to bruise him. Because God knew this is what it takes. This is what must happen for everyone to be delivered from sin and thus from the judgment, the condemnation that would follow. So when Peter come and said, Oh no, far be it from you. I don't want to see you go through this. You know, this is a bad, you know, this is a horrific, you said a horrific thing right here. Like, this is, I'm sorry to hear you say that. No, we don't want you to go go through all this stuff. We don't want you to suffer and be rejected like that. You know, far be it from you. You are the king of the, you're, you're the king, you're the Messiah, you're Mashiach. Jesus turned quickly and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. For you have in mind not the things of God, but the things of men. It's very important, people, when you're going through your life, if you're really a true man or woman of God, if you're really a true, you know, uh, you know, a sheep, if you might if you might call it that way, if you're really a, uh, one of God's precious and holy people, you must keep in mind the things of God, not the things of men. Don't look at the th- don't look at things from a humanly, earthly point of view. Look at things from a heavenly point of view, a spiritual point of view, according to the scriptures. Look at things according to the way God looks at it to the best of your ability. Verse 34, He called the multitude to himself with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I just said that, right? For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. In other words, don't be focused on, on your this life, this earthly life. This life here in this realm. Be focused on the heavenly realms. As Paul said, set your affections on things above. He says, and whoever will lose his life for my sake and for the sake of the good news or the gospel will save it. Okay. In other words, if you lose your life, and he's not speaking, he's not speaking literally like dying, literally biologically dying here. He's saying that, you know, if you lose your life, so to say, you know what, I am going to give up my job if that's what it takes. I'm going to, I'm going to turn away from all worldliness, turn away from all secularism, turn away from the secular music, secular TV, secular everything. And just turn to God with all my heart. I'm going to turn away from selfishness, selfish ambitions, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Turn away from that because that's what the Scripture says. The Scriptures say that is not from the Father, but is from the world. So turn away from those worldly things. Completely sacrifice them on the altar and go after God and just throw yourself at God's mercy. Okay, for we we came into the world with nothing, absolutely nothing and we're going to leave the world with nothing verse 36 for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life and other i like in uh, other translations would say what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul If you, if you gain the whole world with all of his gold and glory and all of everybody in it, if you gain every, if you have everything you want, what good would it be if in the end, which comes pretty fast, by the way, if, if in the end you lose that and your soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his life? Or whoever 
or for whoever will be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man also will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Once again, may God give you great understanding, enlighten your eyes, open your eyes to wonderful spiritual truths into the depths of the Scriptures, and show you great and mighty things so that you would hear him, if you have ears to hear and eyes to see, that you would do so and that you would turn, you would believe, and you would just throw yourself at God's mercy and fear God and love God in the name of Jesus. Thank you for watching and may God bless you.